Hey, this is Dark Hooper, and I'm going to do something, hopefully for you, something that I hope that you enjoy, but also for myself, because I've come up with this kind of new method of coloring stuff, and I like how it's coming out, and I want to make sure that if, uh, you know, I fall into a black hole or something, or go into a coma, and I forget about how I do this, I can always come back to this and see what my method is because what I'm getting right now is stuff that I really like. It, it's much closer to the way that I have in my brain. Like, you know, I have a certain way that I want to do things and I'm always trying to move toward that. And sometimes I'm successful at that. And sometimes I'm not. So in any case, what I want to do is get this down. Not, not just for me, also for you. And, um, you know, explain a little bit about my color process. So what you can see now is a comic page, which has its own, you know, man, if you're doing a comic page, it's different than doing a single illustration because everything has to line up. The color that's in this panel has to be the same color in this panel and the same color in this panel, unless you're changing scenes or you're trying to emphasize something. I mean, it's not a hard and fast rule, but in general, on a comic book page, you want the colors of the page to all match so that it reads like it's all the same scene. And that has its own unique challenges. But the way that I'm coloring these individual panels is also how I've been coloring, you know, single pieces of artwork, just like regular illustrations. So in any case, you can see what I've done so far and realizing that I started with this first panel here and figured out a lot of stuff. <laughs> it took me 10 times longer to do the first panel than it did for me to do the second and third panel. The second and third panel came together quickly. So now I'm on this fourth panel and I'm going to walk you and myself through this process. And ideally, when I get done with this, this last panel will look like these other panels. We'll see. So I'm going to pull this up and get it a little bit closer so that I can really do the work on it. And what I want to point out here is that I'm, I'm working on Clip Studio Paint Pro. For those of you who are interested in the, the fine details, the process, what I'm using, how I'm using it, uh, I'm using a Huion tablet. It's not a tablet that has a screen on it. So I'm drawing below the screen that I'm looking at. If you can afford to get a screen, a, a tablet with a screen, you know, like an iPad or something, that would actually probably be better. But this is what I've used for the last few years. Um, let's say that if I get a, a pretty good investment from somewhere, I will get a, a tablet with a screen on it, just like everyone else uses. But for right now, this is what I'm using. So, um, all right, let's do this thing. Waiting on my tablet to, my old tablet to wake up. So I'm using both my mouse and my tablet. I use my mouth, mouse to navigate. And I use my stylus to do any work. So now I have selected, you notice this says panel four. Uh, one of the great things about Clip Studio Paint is that it will allow you to create these folders. And each folder is a different panel. So I can turn everything else off, which I'm about to do um, because uh, oh, well, I turned off the wrong panel. I'm going to turn off that panel. I'm going to turn off that panel. And I'm going to turn off this lower panel. So now all I have is this, ideally. It's still colored for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, okay. So my first thing is to look at my back tone. 
right? So my back tone is just a layer that runs underneath everything else. And it's all of this. It's And it's just tones. It's just colors. It's all, you know, kind of gray. There's actually not any black in there. But the, the back tone is separated from the figure so that I can make universal changes to that. And the figure, I can make universal changes to that. And they don't cross over, okay? So... To begin with, I'm going to right-click on my back tone panel, and I'm going to choose New Correction Layer and Gradient Map. And then for this piece and this piece only, I've created one. I've created a gradient map. And what a gradient map does is I'm going to click on it so you can. It's not going to show you. What a gradient map does is allow you to choose a range of colors that it maps to the range of colors on your tone. So whether you have a tone or you have colors or whatever, it's going to map over all of that at the same time. So I'm going to double click on this and you can see how it turned it. Not all one color. Okay. Because that is a light blue and that's a dark blue, and that's a medium blue. You understand what I'm saying? If it was all one color, then it would have it, it would not look like this. Oh, here's the here's the range. This is what I wanted. You notice that it starts with like a white, and then it ranges all the way down to kind of a dark blue. Most of the colors are following within this range right here, although there are a few that go up further. And I can adjust this, although I don't want to, because I don't know if I can get back to this. So, but you can grab these little arrows and you can adjust the way that it applies these colors. So if you want more darkness in your gradient map, you can come down here and you can move this, this direction. Or if you want more light colors, like I might grab this and I move it back that direction. You're just going to have to play around with it. Trust me. It's not something that is going to be easy when you do it the first time, but when you realize the great power of this, I mean, I will also say that I could just as, let's see, I could just as easily make it that color. Do you see how, what's happening here? Or I could make it this color. So what it does is allow me to quickly change the color of something. And I mean, I know that there's some artists that go around and they will gradient map like her boots. That'll be a color. And then you can easily change it between purple or red or multiple colors, rainbow colors, whatever it is you want to do. In some cases, like if if my whole figure is not the color that I is not the tone that I want, whether it's too dark or it's too light, I can also use it to change that as well. Like I can make the whole uh, the range of light to dark either darker or lighter using a gradient map. So I'm going to go back down to this, choose this one last time, click OK, and there's my background. Now, one of the things I also do, <laughs> because I'm very clumsy, because there's many, many, many layers on this thing, it is so essential that I lock that layer. And the reason why is because if I don't lock the layer, and then I come back in here later, try to play around with something, I could very easily go back over a layer that I don't want to. So that almost, almost protects me. But while I'm in the middle of this, and maybe even worse while I'm doing a demonstration, it's going to be very easy for me to make mistakes and to get on the wrong layer, and I'm trying not to do that. This next layer here is... Just a, I'm going to remove the layer above it. That is just a medium gray tone layer. So that's what I chose for this. Sometimes it might be a light gray tone or it might be a darker gray tone. It depends on what it is, but it's the figure. So I have a background tone, which I just colored. And then I have a figure tone, which in this case is two figures. It's just for the characters that are touching. I could like I said before, I could literally break this up into here's a tone for her boots and here's a tone for her skin and here's a tone for her hair. I could break all of that up, but 
you know, how much time do I really want to spend on all this? I'm trying to nail this down to the point where it's as quick and efficient and like a factory as much as art is possible, right? So there's my figure tone. When I get my figure tone done, I lock it immediately because it's very easy for me to grab. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to do it right now because it will solve my next few problems. So what I'm going to do right now is you notice this says refer, refer to editing layer only. I'm going to click on the middle of this. Keep in mind, I have a very slow computer. There we go. There it goes. Now it has grabbed just that figure, right? That's the figure tone. That's why I have it like this. And then I copy it up above. You see figure tone copy two. And that's where I do all of my work for my tone. So at any time I can come back and do what I just did, which is just grab this whole thing easily. And then I work that area fully black and white like a painting. So it goes from very dark colors all the way to almost complete white. All right. You can see what happened there. Now I'm not concerned with this layer either. What I'm going to do next is create an additional layer. So there's my raster layer, and I'm going to title it Color Tone. Okay. And the idea of this is that I'm going to color overall this tone so that I can blend it with my flats. And I'll show you what that means here in a moment. But the first thing I'm going to do is go over here and I'm going to go to my ink because ink comes on, ink is 100%. So if I was using like say watercolors, which I will here in a moment, um, you know, it might come out of the brush at 50% or 25%. Ink is 100%. So right now this is my color is blue. It's not the correct color. So what I've done here, let me let me talk a little bit about this, is I'm trying to unify all of my colors. So I'm not making up colors on the fly because it's a comic page. If this was an illustration, I wouldn't go through this process. But what I want is the same colors to be used time and time again so that each of these things come out looking relatively like they're in the same scene. So... What I'm looking for now is my tone color, and that's it right there. So I'm going to double click on my little deal and bring up my color picker. And I'm going to go down here and I'm going to grab that color. And I'm going to say, okay. So now I got my brush loaded with the correct color. And I'm just going to go through this whole thing here and color it. Don't worry. The the wonderful the wonder <laughs> of layers and working on computers is that everything that you do, particularly if you use layers like I am, and I'm using this color tone layer, nothing is destructive. I mean, it is destructive if you're putting everything on the same layer or you don't save things. Or, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do that will make sure that things are destructive, but I'm trying to work so that everything that I do is non-destructive, despite the fact that it looks like I'm completely ruining everything that I'm doing right now. You got to trust me. There's a method to all of this, the silliness. It's going to look crazy until I get to that final step. And that's kind of why I want to demonstrate it to you and kind of why I want to capture it because all of this is kind of, you know, it's going to work counter to the way that you certainly would work if it was analog. I mean, I've done many analog paintings and you don't do it like this. Um, and it might even work counter to, you know, how you would approach doing a digital painting. I'm not saying that this is the correct way to do it. I'm just saying that this is the way I'm doing it right this moment. Right. So now I've colored this whole thing. 
you notice it says color tone and it's sitting right up on top of this figure tone copy. So my next step, I'm going to, I'm going to deselect that. It's still selected. That figure is still selected, but I'm just trying not to ruin what I've just done. Um, I'm going to go from normal to color, which I will use over and over again. And now you can see the result of coloring your toned um, layer. So that's a direct, it's color, and then I'm going to clip to the layer below, right, to make sure that I'm not coloring the background or anything else behind it. I just want it to set on top of that figure tone copy. Now I can move that around and screw up a bunch of stuff, but it's not even interacting with the, the layer below it. It's just this one layer it's clipped to. Okay. So what that does is it gives me kind of a base so that when I start messing with my flat layer, which I'm just about to do, it will allow me to kind of blend those two things together so that everything that I'm doing is unified in some way. And again, you'll see what I'm talking about here in a moment. I just took a swig of wonderful coffee. Refreshing. Um, all right. So I'm on my color tone. The next thing I'm going to do is create another layer. So I'm going to right click on this and I'll create a new raster layer. And this one is going to be called flats. Again, for the sake of sanity and not doing things 10 times over, I'm going to... Re I'm going to remove all of that. And then what I'm going to try to do, because sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't, is to grab my fill, my little bucket, my paint bucket, what they call. And then I'm going to go up here. And the first thing I'm going to do is grab, I'm going to double click on this, get my little picker, and I'm going to go to flesh. Go back to my deal, and I'm going to start filling in my flesh areas. And all I have to do to put this color in here is just tap, tap, tap. Tap here. It's working pretty good, folks. It doesn't always. And yeah, I know her eyes are not flesh color, but I'm trying to kind of complete the all the little circles here. Because I'm not at my final thing. Oh, I'm pretty happy with the way that turned out. That went, that went pretty good. Trying to see if I missed anything. So now what I'm going to do is because I'm going to assume that I missed some stuff, I'm going to get up much closer to it. And you see how it kind of got in into her hair there? That's fine because it, it, this is not the, the final deal. But I just want to see like it didn't get underneath her, her uh, lashes there. It didn't get in her eyebrows totally. I'm just going to do a little clean up here, go a little over this because I'm still, I still have to do all this other stuff, right? Go down here. We're just looking to see that all of the areas are covered. See, it grabbed that little strap there. I'll have to paint that in. Just making sure that we have flesh everywhere. It's supposed to be flesh, 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 flesh. Good flesh, flesh. And I will invariably miss something on this thing. I mean, it's just going to happen. Some illustrators that are like doing comics and stuff will pay people to do their flats, which means they come in here and they do exactly what I'm doing right here. And once you have these colors in these areas, then uh, just like with gradient maps, I could quickly go back in here and do the tappy 
thing that I did before, and it's going to grab each of these colors much easier ne this next time. I mean, it did pretty good this time. But uh, if I wanted to make her skin color purple or something, it would be very easy for me to go right back in and hit every flesh-colored area and change that to purple quickly if I had to. So the next thing I'm going to get, let's do her outfit. So her outfit is this color. I'm going to double tap on here, bring this up, grab the color picker, picker and go to there, outfits. Okay, I got that. I'm all loaded up. I'm going to do color fill, and here we go. I have to tell you something. I know that people do um, what they call adult coloring books or whatever. In many ways, this is exactly like an adult coloring for me. Once you get to this point, this is fun. This is fun for me because the hardest part really is the pencils, is getting those damn pencils out there. Once you have the pencils figured out, the inks are a little stressful, and so is doing the painting of the tones because all of that has to come together correctly, right? But once you get to this point, it's just fun. I'm just having fun here, which is why I'm doing this video, because until I get to this point, I'm sweating it. It's, it's killing me. Now it's not killing me so much. See how I painted that in there? The reason why that didn't paint in when I was... Uh, like when I was doing the flesh, it grabbed all of that because it had that little open area there. And sometimes it picks up these open areas and it works great. And then sometimes it just doesn't. And there's no hard and fast rule on this. I mean, I'm requiring this thing to do a lot, to be honest. So it should be no surprise to anyone that some of this doesn't work because again, <laughs> Painting all of this in with a click of a button is still pretty wonderful. Still pretty wonderful. Let's do our hair next. It's going to be this over and over again until I get all of my flats. So what is her hair? There's her hair right there. That's the color. I click OK. Go back to this. In this case, I could click in here and stuff, but I've already kind of messed with this by putting the flesh color in here kind of over coloring. So I'm going to kind of have to do the actual color here. And the idea on this is because I'm using this ink stuff, I'm, I'm still doing a little rendering. Notice I shut up when I'm thinking about rendering. <laughs> That's an automatic save there. I didn't do that. I also have to wait for the computer sometimes. After I get done with her hair, I'm going to save this thing. Because that's a good idea. This looks large on my screen, but the reality is that this area that I'm painting in is very small. I'm using a size 60 brush, which is probably larger than I should be using. But because it's got a little sharp point on this, this ink brush, I can get away with doing that. If this were a watercolor brush, I would have to use a much smaller brush. All right, I got her hair. We're in good shape. What's next? Let's do the necklace.
So it's the same thing over and over again. Some of this is so small that it's, it kind of takes a little bit of finesse, a little time. I just hit undo because I went outside the lines. I never had undo when I was using crayons, right? It's pretty nice. Let's do her eyes next. So there's the eye color. Double click. Mind you, you have to set all this shit up while you're doing it. There's the eye color. I know this looks ridiculous. Just hang with me. It will all come together here in a moment. The eye color also, incidentally, is all of my metal pieces. So there's a metal piece. And there's a metal piece. Am I getting all this? I got to get closer here. There. These things, I mean, it looks large here, but this is so small. I mean, it's almost infinitesimal. And I want to point something else out. Note how. This little area here is actually, I mean, you're, you probably don't know this, but I'm telling you <laughs> that this little area in here, that little square is not supposed to be that color. It's supposed to be purple like the rest. So I'm going to go in and grab that purple real quick and hit that little area right there. And then there. And then there. So there we go. All right, back to my other Still not through with my metal stuff. I got metal all over the place. So back to my eye color, which is also my metal color. Looking down through here, no metal. I got a little metal over here and then another couple of eyes of this little doggy. It's the first time we've done anything on the dog. Probably shouldn't be doing the eyes first, but that's, that's what we got. Okay, metal parts. He's got a little leash here. I'm going to do the metal parts around the leash right there. And then there's a little hook, which you can't see all that great, but it's there. And then a uh, one of those little clips that goes on the leash. Did I say leash twice? That's a collar. Here's a leash. You can see the leash running here over her lap. So just painting in the metal parts right now. I think that's everything. Um, since we're on the doggy, let's paint him. Now. Dog. Got this loaded up. Let's see if there's any of the, uh, I will try to fill this. Fill, fill. The, the color of the dog is kind of a kind of black and white. And I originally leaned towards like kind of a brownish color or something, but it just wasn't looking right. So I changed it to this kind of bluish color. And 
when it's all wrapped up, it's, oh, look at that, how that came in there. That was wonderful. Then his leg and his little paws. All right. We're almost there. Back to my... Now I'm going back in. You notice it didn't quite catch everything. Like there's a little area right here. Little area here. I'm trying to grab all the little areas that it didn't do all of it like it was supposed to. Which is, you know, just the nature of what we got going on here. Notice I'm trying to paint this area, but because of the way that the selection is, it's not allowing me to do that. Like, I, I'd like to go up through there. I can't do that. Now I could go back there and do that later. Um, we'll see how it looks. We'll see how it looks. May not be necessary, or it very well might be necessary. All right, I think we're good there. Let's do the leash next. Same thing. Grab this. Leash is pink. It's also the same thing that I've used for his, his tongue. I'm painting that in. I'm going to try to hit the bucket on some of this. It should work okay. Oh, I missed that little area for this. Yeah. All right, I got to go back. <laughs> Do that right there. And then this area right here is actually his back leg. So I got to get that too. So I'm going to go back to my dog purple. Or my dog blue, I guess I should say. And I'm going to color that in. And then notice how this little area right here is a little shaky. Got to clean that up, and I got to clean this up. All right. Now, one more time, I'm going to go back to this leash color because the leash and the collar are both the same color. So let's do this, and most of this I'm going to have to paint in. for two reasons. Number one, my line work is a little sketchy here. So when your line work is sketchy, you got to figure this stuff out after the fact. Then also, some of this other stuff is not coming in right. So that's the nature of this. Is that sometimes... You have to do this a few different ways. So there's no line here, but I'm creating it just like that. I think I'm going to go back and hit his eyes one more time, too. There's the eye color. Just trying to make sure. Again, I realize that this all, you're thinking, how the heck does this all come together? Well, we're getting close. We're getting close to this coming. You, you're going to see it all happen at the same time. Oh, we don't have her lips yet. Let's get that. And then I think we're done with this 
for a second. to get in closer here. So small. I think flats look like old cell anima animation. I think I've said that. But it's kind of fun for me to create stuff that sometimes I just enjoy you know, this version of the color. Like, I could leave the coloring like this. I could design the whole thing to specifically be this. And just let it be. And there will be projects which, where I will do that. All right, there's her lips. Notice that I was still rendering there. I didn't just, you know, click something and go to it. I also noticed an area where I have messed up. So I'm going to hit that. It's right here by her eyes. Got to get that area. All right, I'm going to put my pin up for a minute. I'm going to back up on this. Take a look at the whole thing, see if I got it or not. And by the way, if I don't have it, I can always come back. I think I have it. So those are my flats. And that's what cell animation looks like. And in this case, that's what my flats look like. So... Once again, I am going to, well, first I'm going to save this thing because it's time. Give that just a moment. Surprisingly, that went very fast. I have an old computer. Sometimes that takes way too long. So this color tone is at 100% and it's, set to color. Flats is set to 100%, and I'm about to set it to color, and you're going to see that it's going to change a little bit. Oh, it didn't change at all, because it's at 100%. That's my point. Um, now, what I'm going to do is, this is the new thing that I'm doing, because what I used to do is I used to do basically the color tone layer I used to do for the entire thing. But this gives me so much more latitude. And here's where the magic happens. Hopefully it works correctly this time because I just did it on the last panel and it didn't work because it didn't have everything set up correctly. What I want to do is take this flat layer where everything is colored natively. Like it's, you know, her flesh is the correct flesh color and her outfit is the correct outfit color and the leash is the correct leash color, etc. And then meld it with the color that I have in the background, which is kind of an orangish color, and the tone, and then adjust it a little bit until I get what I want. And what works so well for me with this is that if I feel like it's too grayish, then I can put some more of this flat tone in it, which is color, or if it's too colorful, I can back off of it a little bit. And I can do I can do that with both, both the color tone and the flats. So somewhere in between there is the magic number. And for what I've been doing with this comic page, it seems like using my color at 70% is the correct amount. So I'm going to back off of this and put it at 70. Yes, and of course it's not working. Oh, it's not working because I don't have the rest of the stuff dialed in. Well, that's good. That allows me to, to, to show you. See, now it's at 70%, and then I'm going to add the color tone, which is still not going to do anything until I put the, the everything else in there. And then I'm going to click the figure tone, and now there we are. Figure tone too. So now you can see what this thing looks like when it's all together. It's got a little bit of color. Um, it has the unifying orange underneath it. 
And I have a little area right here, which I got to get rid of, by the way, where her fingers are showing through to the background. But you can also see how much work is being done here. Now, I'm going to adjust the flats a little bit just to kind of see one way or another how it looks. So if I put more flats into it, so instead of 70, I'm going to go up to 80, right? It's going to look like that. Notice how it kind of is a little less colorful. Or I could go back down, and that's maybe too colorful. 50 is too colorful. Let's try 60. 60 is pretty good. Let me go on up to 70 again. 70 is where I had it, and then 80. 80, see how it gets kind of dull? It's colorful, but not as colorful as I would like at 80. I may be the only person that can see this or cares, but I'm trying to figure out something right now. I think what I'm going to do is go down to 60. So this one is 10% less than the, the others. So hopefully to bring a little bit more color into it. That's it. And the, the color is this color tone that I'm allowing through this. And because this thing says color and this thing says color, it's bleeding through to this this toned area, right? It's coloring over the toned area. That's what I'm getting. All right. Now I'm going to lock that in. I'm going to bring in my background again because that's going to set it off. Notice how that sets it off nicely. All right. And then I have two other things that I need to do to wrap this up. Well, and I got to take care of this little area here, <laughs> but I will do that maybe here in a minute. Um, okay. So the next step that I have is what I call rows. So I'm going to add a raster layer. We're going to name it rows. And once again, I'm going to set this thing to color so it's still not wiping out. If I didn't set it to color, then it would just be the color that I put in there, the color and the tone and everything. I'm trying to keep that tone because I've done so much work on that tone painting. And, um, you know, I don't want to lose that. That's one of the things that I discovered back when I started doing coloring is that there's a lot of elements of color including, you know, your tone, your saturation level and everything. When I tried to do it all at once, I wasn't getting the results that I wanted. By doing tone, I make sure that I have something that is all the way from white all the way to black. So I have a range of tones. When I, If I had to pick each one of these individual colors while I was doing work, it would take me twice as long and not be as effective. So what I'm going to do now, I told you I was doing this rose tone. I'm going to go to watercolors now and I'm on transparent, right? I'm going to go to my illustration deal and you notice I got rose down there. I'm going to grab that. And then I'll explain what I'm doing. The, the, the colors and the range on these colors is pretty good. But what I have learned is that if you can throw a little chaos in stuff and a little extra color, it pays off. And what do I mean by that? So this is a transparent watercolor, not an opaque. And which means that I can kind of work an area slowly and put a little bit in there because there's not too much. Um, one of the great inventions <laughs> of um, Instagram is that a lot of these artists, particularly artists that are doing, you know, like face portraits and stuff, they like to have kind of rosy cheeks and rosy noses, you know, like you used to put rosy noses on people who were, um, you know, out outside, like during wintertime. Now, 
models, like actual physical people, will like paint their nose red to get that look that, that's on there. Well, it, it's a good look. That's the reason why everyone wants to do it is because uh, it just gives your face a little color. In addition, this look, the, the flesh looks fine. But if you put a little rose or a little orange in it, mind you, I have orange underneath everything already. But if you put a little um, rose color or orange color, depending on which direction you want to go, it makes flesh look more alive, like there's some blood pumping underneath it. And that's really what I'm doing right now, is just creating a little life with this. So I'm going to go over this little area. Notice how, I mean, maybe you see it, maybe you don't. Like I'm just, I'm hitting the corners of her. You can see it pretty good there. And then kind of concentrating on the nose and the cheeks. And then I might run up a little on her head and down here. And then I'll put a little kind of in her chest and maybe up here in his shoulders, just hit, hitting a few areas. I'm going to put it on his nose right here, maybe down on his. I, I like putting stuff like kind of on the hands and knuckles. Just give it kind of like there's a little something going on there. And because I have this area selected, I don't have to worry about whether it's like put it on his chest. Notice how it's just kind of livening everything up. Do this right here. It almost looks like it's glowing, right? I'm going to hit this area underneath here. I'm trying to spread this out. There's no right and wrong on this, mind you. I'm just trying to give it a little life. Maybe underneath her neck a little bit. Maybe her ears, right? I think that's pretty good. Okay. Notice how that just made it look like she just got through running a minute ago. Like there's a little, there's a little blood pumping through her. It just livens up the stuff, makes it look a little bit more dynamic, which is what I like about it. And it throws a little chaos in there, which again, I think is important. So there's my rose area. And that's just, look, I've used all kinds of crazy colors for that. And it just depends on the scene and what you're doing. But it tends to be, um, you know, warm, reddish or orangish colors that I use. If it was like Gamora, <laughs> and Gamora is a Marvel Cinematic Universe character who is green, I wouldn't use that. I wouldn't use that color. I might use blue or purple or something to show the blood going through her veins. If it was, if it was a Klingon, I might choose a different, you know, you know what I'm saying? You have to figure out what color you can add to the character that will look like, you know, blood that's, that's uh, working with them. So it doesn't have to be this color, but if it's a human, you're usually going to be using that red to orangish color. And that, that goes for people from Scandinavia all the way to people from Africa. Okay. So it works, you know, no matter what. And again, if you're doing She-Hulk, um, you know, you might choose a different color, like a bluish or a purple or, or whatever. M maybe you use red on that too. I don't know how that would work necessarily, but it doesn't have to be red. Okay. So what's my next thing? My last little step here. We're, we're almost done. I have no idea how long this has taken to do this. Hopefully I haven't lost you yet. I'm going to do a new raster layer. I'm going to double click on this. And this last one I'm going calling ambient. Now, they have a thing called ambient occlusion. And I'm kind of doing that in, uh, in video games. So in video games, they have a, a term they call ambient occlusion. I'm going to go here and grab my color here while I'm talking. Notice I have ambient over here. It's been the same for every panel. This time, instead of color, I'm going to use vivid light. So what this is going to look like is kind of like a neon glow, like it's light that's coming in and hitting the characters. 
ambient occlusion is like basically this area right here where like if light is coming in from this direction or light is cut, like I've indicated that there's some light coming in from this direction as well. There's a little area in here where light's just not going to hit. But unless you're in a controlled environment, like if you're outside or, I mean, I don't know where she is in this environment, but it's, it's clear that she's not in a dark room. If she was in a dark room, this might be completely black. I mean, there's just, you know, nothing's going to get to it. But ambient light is like in the shadows of the figure. It's not lit by anything else, but it's still being colored or lit from bounced light. Okay. Or to separate out two different areas. I'm also using this as kind of a rim light. So even though it's not in the shadows, I'm also using it to kind of separate her from the background a little bit. So it's doing two things for me. And I could do this twice, but I'm trying not to spend the rest of my life on this on this deal. So I'm using it for both of the things that I just laid out. So in general, like I said, there is light coming from here, but I'm going to pretend like the light is coming from this direction. So I'm going to mostly do stuff with this ambient on the other, this ambient light on the other side and in the shadows. That's my thought. It's vivid light, and now I'm going to get started. So I'm going to do a little bit on the side of her face here. Notice what is happening. And underneath here, it's a shadow. And then maybe here. Then maybe on her necklace, pretty hard. More, more, more. Hitting it. Notice how it kind of made a glowy look here. I'm going to do it on the inside of her outfit here on her breasts. And down through here, again, kind of in shadows. Notice how it lights everything up. I'm going, I pointed out this particular area. I'm going to hit it right in there. And underneath there, and underneath there, right? I'm hitting this on this side. Maybe a little here, too. How about through here? I'm going to do it pretty heavy right here. I'm going to keep going over a few times. I'm not going to leave the dog. I'm going to do some here underneath her, her arm. And I'm just lightly, look, this is transparent watercolor. It's not very, I mean, I'd have to go over it 10 times to really nail down this color right here, which is a pretty saturated blue. Obviously, I'm not doing that. Um, now I'm going to do it on the dog. And I'm going to do it kind of along this side right here. Notice how it kind of makes it look like he's lit up there a little bit. And again, it just creates, I had the, the red come in here. And now I've got a little bit of this blue in here. I'm going to put some in her, her hand. And a little bit underneath, like a little smaller. I'll put it underneath him, in, under his carriage here. <laughs> all right. So now all of these things together has created, hopefully, a little chaos in here. And the, the added benefit of, particularly when you're dealing with, I mean, this is all latex, latex, latex. Anytime you're doing with latex, you want it to look like it's picking up every color and every light in the room because latex is very reflective. And if you don't have some color coming in here, in addition to the, I mean, it's supposed to be black. I didn't really color it. The color is actually kind of a dark purple. But um, because I don't believe in not having a little bit of color everywhere, um, I'm going to put a little bit more in this area 
going to be in his ear. Um, the idea here is to just create a little bit of chaos and a little bit of color and to indicate that there's more going on here than just me drawing on uh, this canvas. So now what I'm going to do is go up here to select and deselect because I've had this whole area selected this entire time, right? And that's to keep me from coloring into this background. And um, now you can see the way this thing looks. That is pretty much complete. I do have this little area here. I will go back and mess with that here in a minute. Um, but I don't think that that's going to be all that exciting if you're watching a video. So there's still going to be a little cleanup that I do. It's not completely done. And I also have to uh, add the captions and the sound effects. That's going to take me about another hour to get that finished. But uh, at least this portion of this panel is done. And so is this video. Thank you for watching it very much. And uh, hopefully I'll talk to you again soon.